Howdy doody buckaroonies, and welcome back to another episode of Morning Coffee with Cameron. Today we're here for something a little bit different. I wanted to talk about what microphones I use and why. I get asked about this stuff quite a bit because I know a lot of you guys that watch the channel either work in the sound design industry in some capacity and you're just curious as to what I use, or you are totally new or just getting started and want to know what you need to get started in this whole thing. So today I wanted to walk you through my setup and talk about everything I use and why I use it. I have quite a few microphones phones I've gathered over the years, and honestly, I feel like I could get rid of a lot of them and not even know they were gone. So I figured that if I can prevent you guys from wasting a bunch of money like I have over the years, then that seems like a video that's worth making. Before we start digging into the setup though and get all hyped up about gear and toys, because I know that's really exciting, I wanted to just quickly remind everyone that no matter what, there is and forever will be nothing standing in your way from getting out there and creating something. And for anyone who tells you otherwise, feel free to send them this convenient timestamp in the video so I can personally say, please shut the hell up and go lick a rock because you probably don't know what you're talking about. Now, that isn't to say that having good gear doesn't help. Of course, it's nice to have nice things, but it really doesn't make the biggest difference between someone who knows what they're doing with what they have and someone who has a bunch of stuff and has no idea how to use it. You can have all the fun gear in the world, but if you don't really understand how to take advantage of it, it's not going to help you at all. Above all else, the most powerful tool any sound designer has is the lump conveniently located about three feet above your ass, as my dad would say. And I think it's really important to remember that no matter what your setup or budget or whatever is, as long as you're willing to put in the time to learn, understand, and practice with it, you will be infinitely more successful than people who blow a bunch of money on cool stuff and think that that is going to save them. Now, overall, I like to think I have a pretty straightforward and cost-effective setup for my microphones when it comes to my selection for field recording and sound design, and this is because I keep a couple criteria in mind when I'm selecting microphones that I will list off here for you now. Number one, I need microphones that are easily portable. I need something that's not enormous and gigantic and requires all of this extra setup. It needs to be something I can put in my bag and take with me, and it can be with me no matter where I'm going or what I am doing. Number two, I need microphones that capture an authentic version of a sound. If I'm recording something, I want that recording to sound like what I was trying to record. While it is fun to have mics with lots of weird character and color, that's often not what I need especially when it comes to sound design stuff. I want a nice, clean, pure version of that sound that I can manipulate, mangle, or just use as is later on. Number three, I need microphones that aren't crazy expensive. While everyone loves big $12,000 ribbon mics or $5,000 condensers or whatever, these aren't things I can bring with me into the field because sometimes things happen. It can rain, it can snow. Sometimes I am recording a sound that puts my microphone at risk of being damaged and or destroyed. So I need stuff that's affordable in the event that something happens and it's not going to break the bank if I do need to replace it. Number four, I need microphones that are good at a lot of things. I need a microphone that is good at recording very quiet, detailed sounds and is just as comfortable recording big, loud, industrial booms and just about everything in between. I have a limited amount of space and I don't want to carry around 500 microphones with me all day, so I need microphones that act well for all around purposes of recording just about anything, at least as much as reasonably possible. Number five, I need microphones that function just as well here in my studio as they do out in the real world. I want a microphone that can capture good, high quality recordings here in a nice, comfortable, treated environment, and I need microphones that deliver high quality professional results if I'm out in a junkyard smashing a bunch of stuff. And number six, above all else, I need microphones that are functional and provide the results I need. While I love cool bells and whistles as much as the next guy, when it comes to fancy features and a bunch of flashy marketing stuff, I really can't take that into account when I am making a purchase. I need to buy something that is going to get the job done. I think this is also compounded by the fact that I work in this industry and a lot of my paycheck depends on getting really high quality recordings. So if I waste my money on something, no matter how fancy and expensive it is, if it's just not functional and provides no actual tangible, perceivable benefit to my setup, then I don't get to eat. So I have to be pretty picky and make sure that if I am getting something, it's actually going to be something I will use and get a return on that investment. In order to keep this video nice and tight and free of any miscellaneous fluff, I'm going to show you my microphones for my sound design and field recording setup, and I wanted to tell you the main five factors about them. What is it? What does it do and why is it useful? How much does it cost? How much do you actually need it? And what are the disadvantages or any main considerations to keep in mind when using or selecting that type of microphone? So let's get into it. 
First up, we have your phone's microphone. Now, a quick disclaimer before anyone tries to go all screeching in the comments, I've used my smartphone for tons of samples over the years, many of which have ended up in professional commercial libraries on services like Splice or Loopmasters or elsewhere. And as someone who works in this industry professionally, let me tell you that anyone who says it's not possible to get good results with this just frankly doesn't know what they're doing, and probably is also one of those people who sits around leaving shitty comments on YouTube videos all day because they're too busy not actually working in this industry in any real capacity. So, boom, roasted, checkmate. Everybody has a smartphone anymore, and as long as it's a smartphone from within like the last decade or so, it probably actually has a pretty decent microphone to capture audio on the go without carrying a ton of audio gear and looking like a complete psychopath when you're trying to sample that sick sound of the escalator at the mall. There are a ton of free apps to do voice recording, and most phones have some kind of voice recording thing built in anymore. I actually use a free app here called Smart Recorder, which allows me to capture high-resolution lossless audio files with my phone, and the mic overall isn't the best quality ever, but it does offer the advantage of being with me all the time. So that brings us to the next point, how useful is it? Your phone mic is honestly probably one of the most useful mics you have. It's not like I carry my field recording gear everywhere I go. Sometimes you're out and about and you just hear a really awesome creaking door or a weird kid's toy or like a... I don't know, like a cool trash can or something, and considering how much processing goes into things after the fact, it really doesn't matter all that much what it was recorded with, even if it was something as simple as a cell phone. Plus, as mentioned before, it's incredibly discreet. Sometimes I want to record stuff and don't want to stand out like a weirdo, so it's useful to have in a pinch. That brings us to cost, and your phone, assuming you already own it, you may even be watching this video on it, costs exactly zero dollars to use, so it's really the most cost-effective solution to getting started with a career in sound design or getting started building up your own custom sample library. Of course, everybody needs a smartphone. It's useful, it's cost effective, it's discreet, it's certainly good enough to get the job done in a lot of situations, and your phone also does a lot of other great stuff for sound designers like creating task lists, responding to emails, client meetings, designing social media graphics, and of course, RAID SHADOW Finally, that brings us to disadvantages. The only big disadvantages to smartphone mics is that they aren't really the best quality usually. They can be kind of noisy as they typically have some kind of like auto gain thing that will lift the noise floor pretty significantly in quiet recordings, and they don't really capture ultra detailed high-end or low-end information, so they aren't the best overall for recording big deep booms or crispy foley or anything like that. But that said, it's not impossible. In a quiet room, you can actually get some pretty impressive sounds from your smartphone. Ah, all right, next up, here we go. Zoom H4n Pro. This is a portable recorder capable of capturing really high quality audio with the built-in microphones or using the external inputs, and it can capture in up to 24-bit at 96K for ultra pristine audio. Typically, I run everything at 24 bits, 48K, but it is nice to have that extra resolution for situations where I'll likely be performing pretty extreme pitch or time stretching to the audio. Now, I think obviously for a sound designer, a good field recorder is just invaluable. This thing is the bread and butter of my recording setup and lets me capture studio grade audio wherever I am, and it just works, and I think that is a pretty big value proposition in and of itself. It can be a little fussy to dive through like the menu and stuff when I'm out and about on a session and need to change a setting or something, but outside of that, it just records stuff and does it well, and ultimately that's all that matters to me. So in terms of cost, this guy costs about $230, give or take, and while that might seem like a little bit of a steep price point, I think it's well worth it because not only do you get a nice field recorder, but you also get external inputs to use your favorite microphones on the go, including microphones that require phantom power. There are a lot of other field recorders out there and a lot of cheaper ones, but personally, I think it's best to spend a little bit more and get one with external inputs so that even if you don't have other microphones at the moment, it's an investment that you can grow into as your setup expands, and that way you're not spending even more money later on buying a new field recorder to add your cool microphones to. You just have it ready to go, but you start off in a bit of a better place. So that brings us to the next point. How much do you actually need this thing? 
While it's not 10,000% necessary to have a field recorder, it does make a huge difference in the quality of recordings you can get compared to something like your phone or a phone with an external microphone plugged in. The added resolution, the better overall audio quality and preamps and whatnot, the ability to use external microphones, and the portability make it a great overall investment to take your field recording sessions up to the next level. In terms of the downsides, I wanted to just, I guess, speak about this specific unit here as there isn't really a real downside I can think of for a field recorder beyond ones that are just cheap garbage or the fact that it costs a little bit of money as it's just a necessary piece of equipment for a sound designer to have. The H4N Pro here doesn't really have a great battery life. The built-in mics are kind of so-so, but they do work in a pinch, or if I need to be a bit more discreet, and the phantom power will absolutely kill your batteries in no time. So to really use this in the field, you should plan on also getting a battery bank with a charging cable. With this, you can run it for several hours at a time with no problems at all. I think at the moment my biggest gripe I have with this is that it only has these two external inputs and I would really like at least four because I find two mics to be a little bit limiting in some situations, so I'll likely be upgrading this at some point in the near future. With that said though, I will definitely keep this thing around because it is really handy to have and just gets the job done. Next up here, we have the Lewitt 040 Matched Pair. Uh, recently, my friends at PSP AudioWare put me in touch with the folks at Lewitt, and originally, after my go-to pair of small diaphragm condensers kind of crapped out on me, I was looking at some more high-end options that had a price tag to match, but the folks at PSP had such good things to say about the people at Lewitt that I decided to give them a spin, and man, was I just kind of shocked at how good these things are. So I got in touch with Lewitt, and they sent me over a couple of their microphones to try out, and I've really been digging these things because they are incredibly clean sounding, pick up even the smallest details, and have no real self noise to speak of and perform incredibly well for just about anything, and I can't really say the same about my old pair of small diaphragm condensers from Sterling Audio. In the last couple of weeks, I've really used these on almost every single session I've done, along with my shotgun mic, and haven't felt any real need to change them out because they're just so functional overall for every application. So why are small diaphragm condensers useful? A good pair of matched small diaphragm condensers like these offers a few things to your recording setup. They're often a lot better than the built-in mics of your field recorder. They allow you to take advantage of stereo mic setups or dual mic positions that wouldn't be possible otherwise, like maybe you want one close mic and one really far away or something like that, so that's nice to be able to do. They provide a really detailed response and capture a lot of little nuances to a sound, which makes for really great sounding recordings and capturing performances of you know, hitting stuff or someone playing an instrument or whatever it may be. I think one of the other big things is that because these are better than your built-in field recorder microphones or your cell phone mics, it just makes your life a bit easier. If you record really nice sounding audio right from the start, there's a lot less work after the fact to make it sound good. So with all this great stuff said, these things probably cost a fortune, right? Well, no. What really blew my mind about these is the price on these mics. This pair comes in at only $189, and I was ready for Perspective here to drop almost $2,000 on some high-end microphones. And honestly, I think I'd put these up there with some of the mics I was looking at any day. They perform really well, they're very detailed for sounds with lots of little nuances and whatnot. They sound really, really transparent and accurate, and they're just so damn cheap. So this is also great because I was afraid of shelling out a lot of cash for microphones because if something happened to them, I'd be shelling out even more cash to replace them. And with these, in the event that something did happen, it's really no big deal to replace them because they're under $200. So that brings us to the next category of Cameron's sound design field recording ranking system 4.0 3000. How necessary are these things? External microphones certainly aren't absolutely necessary to get work as a sound designer, but a good set of matched small diaphragm condensers is a really good investment into your setup to get better quality recordings and to be able 
to experiment with recordings in new ways. Like I mentioned, you can do setups with two independent microphones that are a lot different than what you could do with the fixed XY setup on your field recorder. So just a good thing to keep in mind. Now let's talk downsides. With these mics, I can't really say anything stands out to me other than that maybe they're not the best for getting really big low end response, but there are other ways to get around that either in post or with some different miking techniques. They do pick up a good amount of bass, but it can require a bit of work after the fact to really get those rich, deep subtones. However, this isn't really a fault of these microphones specifically as this is kind of a fact of life with small diaphragm condensers in general. When it comes to compensating for the lack of bass, usually I'll just use something like the Denise Bass XL plugin to enhance the low end or pair them up with a different mic to record the bass end of a sound like a contact mic or a large condenser if possible. The other major downside is that this does require a bit of extra investment that might not be a realistic thing, especially at first. You'll need a field recorder with extra inputs that can provide phantom power, so you've gotta add that onto this. You're gonna need cables to run all this. You're probably also gonna need a battery bank to run all this, so you've gotta tack that on there. You're gonna need a stereo bar. I just bought the Lewitt stereo bar, so you gotta have that. You're gonna need a bunch of stuff to carry this with, you know, a bag or something. And you're gonna need something like this, which is a giant boom pole. I have the Movo boom pole, so Overall, getting into external microphones is gonna require a bit of external setup and extra cost, so you're gonna have to add on a couple hundred dollars on top of the initial investment to really get everything you need, but I think it is certainly something that's worthwhile. And mic swap, because this is the microphone I use for all my YouTube videos, so right now you're actually hearing me through one of the Lewitt 040 small diaphragm condensers. This is the Deity S-Mic 2, which is a shotgun microphone that's very affordable and is awesome for field recording. I saw a bunch of ads for Deity at one point for whatever reason, and I got in touch with them about this, and they sent me one of these to give it a spin because a lot of their content focused on the applications of the S-Mic 2 for video production for independent filmmakers or YouTubers, and I thought this could be a really great mic for sound design because a lot of other shotgun microphones marketed towards the music side of things for field recording or studio applications or whatever seem to be pretty pricey, and the lower priced options sounded pretty blah at best. So why is a shotgun microphone useful? Shotgun microphones, if you're not familiar, are a special type of microphone with a very tight polar pattern. What this means in practice is that they're very good at recording what's in front of them while negating all the other stuff going on around them. This isn't to say that it won't pick up noises and whatnot to the sides of it, but they're excellent at capturing a very focused image of a sound, and this means I can get a nice tight image of a sound and get a detailed recording as well because shotgun mics like small diaphragm condensers are pretty sensitive and snappy to pick up all the nice crispy bits. The S-Mic 2 here is still actually pretty affordable, but it is a bit costly. This comes in at $359, so it's nothing to sneeze at, but I think it's still in what I would consider the price range of your average person. Now, personally, I'm thinking about picking up another one of these to record in stereo with them because I really just love the sound and versatility of this microphone overall, and it really doesn't break the bank. So practically speaking, how much do you actually need one of these things? A good shotgun mic is a great tool for your arsenal to capture sounds and also work in different settings on the go to capture a tight focus sound in a maybe otherwise noisy environment. Like other external microphones, it's not absolutely necessary, especially if you're just getting started. But again, it can help you get higher quality results from your sessions, which sometimes can be the difference between being the person who gets the gig and the person who does not. So disadvantages, I think similar to small diaphragm condensers, the main disadvantage is the extra investment to actually use this thing. Again, you're gonna need a field recorder with some kind of external input, you're gonna need a phantom power source or a field recorder that provides it, some kind of battery bank probably, and some kind of mic pole or stand. Beyond that, a blimp like this one here is also a great idea to prevent any wind noise and handling noise in the field and will also cost a little bit extra. I use one from Movo here that's not too pricey, but it does save me a lot of headaches. It's got this big dead cat on it to prevent any wind noise and whatnot. It's also got some rubberized strings inside, so if I'm wiggling around or whatever, the microphone doesn't pick up that handling noise. So it does contribute to the overall cost of getting started, but is something very, very useful to have. 
With all that in mind, like any external microphone, I guess really you're gonna need to add like a few hundred dollars on top of your initial investment for this mic to really use it out in the wild, but again, I think it is money well spent. Next up, that brings us to these bad boys, which are contact microphones. These are awesome, and I love these things. Contact microphones are really useful little doodads to get a different perspective on sound and can give you some really unique results. Your typical microphone, in case you didn't know, records by waiting for changes in air pressure to arrive at the capsule, and that wiggles around, and that's what's transmitted through the cable into your recorder. Contact mics are cool because instead, they work on the vibration of a surface, and this can be literally anything. You just stick these on, and you could record the sound of your freezer door as you get ice cubes for a drink. You could record a bridge as cars drive by. You could record the sound of your coffee as you pour coffee into your cup. You could record the sound of knocking on a table, the vibration of a big metal plate, like a plate reverb, and a whole lot more. The best part about contact microphones overall though is that they are stupid affordable. You can even build them yourself and get hundreds of the capsules for these things for only like a couple bucks on Amazon. These were actually a gift from my wife for Christmas and only cost $12, and they're a lot of fun. I've had a lot of good times with these things so far, and I'm sure I will have many more good recording sessions in the future, and when they inevitably break because I do something stupid with them, they don't cost anything to replace. So these, I think, are a pretty cool little thing to add. When it comes to the necessity of contact microphones, contact mics aren't necessary at all, but they are a lot of fun and can allow you to get some really unique sounds that you might not have been able to capture otherwise, and that can mean you get to capture sounds that nobody has ever heard before. They also do sound a bit weird, and the frequency response is a bit goofy compared to big studio microphones, but this is really compensated for the fact that you can record things that just aren't possible otherwise. In terms of other downsides, I guess, I, I honestly just can't think of any. You need a field recorder with some external inputs and a couple of cables, but even with cheap cables like this one here that I got, for probably $30, you could have some new sounds that you've never heard before. So that's really kind of it for my field recording setup, but let's talk studio microphones, and these are just a few extra things for the sake of being thorough I wanted to share and talk about. First up, we've got this here, which is the Lewitt LCT440 Pure. This, again, is a very recent addition to my setup, also sent to me by Lewitt. This is a really great large diaphragm condenser that offers a nice full range response and pretty crisp and clean audio. In terms of price, this is only $269, making it super affordable overall, and it just sounds amazing. Honestly, had I known about this thing sooner, I probably would have just bought this instead of my AKG C214, as I like the sound of this better, honestly. It doesn't quite have the same bass response, maybe, as the C214, but the high end on this is infinitely smoother sounding, because the AKG can be incredibly harsh and brittle. I think this is a really great buy if you have a good room to record in. So as a sound designer slash field recorder person, how much do you actually need this thing? A good large diaphragm condenser is a great investment for your studio to record amazing sounding audio as long as you have a decent room to record in. So it's really a matter of cost versus benefit here, as treating your room and all that can be a pretty big investment, especially if you have nothing to begin with, and if that's even possible for you to do. If you're renting like an apartment or something, you probably can't go adding on a bunch of holes in your walls and adding carpet and stuff like that, and you may just frankly not have the space to treat your room. It is worth saying as well that for field recording, it's also possible to use this, but it's pretty rare that I bring any large diaphragm condenser with me as they're just a bit bulky, it requires a stand, and it's just kind of clunky to operate in what are often more run and gun situations. But on the occasion that I'm recording, let's say someone's drum kit at their house or whatever, and I have the space and time to set up microphones, I might bring a couple of big mics like this along with me to record in a different way. In terms of the downsides of this microphone, there aren't really any I can think of. It maybe lacks a little bit of really low bass stuff, but that's pretty easy to fix after the fact. And it also doesn't have any other polar patterns, so it's just a cardioid microphone, which can be a little frustrating. But Lewitt does offer other mics with multiple polar patterns that are also super affordable. And especially compared to the competition, the bigger version of this that has multiple polar patterns only comes in at $399, which I would say is well within the realm of possibility for just about anyone. 
Next up, the AKG C214. This is one of my studio staples that I've had for many years now and has acted as kind of one of my all around microphones for just about everything. This is a super clean sounding large diaphragm condenser with good frequency response and can be used for just about anything. I love the sound of this thing on instruments, Foley, drums, and whatever else I might be recording. And it also does a really great job of capturing some nice big bassy low end. In terms of the price, you can find these for about $350 to $400 or thereabouts. It's a bit pricey, but is a decent large diaphragm condenser and a good investment if you have a good space to record in, just like I said for the Lewitt microphone. As mentioned with the Lewitt, uh, large diaphragm condensers I think are a good to have and not really a necessity, at least in my opinion, especially, again, if you don't have a good room to work in. If you bring this out in the field, you're probably just going to have a bad time. In terms of the downsides of this microphone, the high end is almost unbearable at times. It sounds pretty good on a lot of things like vocals, but even then it can be really harsh and sibilant sounding. And this is mostly an AKG thing, I guess as far as I'm aware, as a lot of their large diaphragm condensers have the same type of character, just being really airy and bright, which can be a bit of a disadvantage. Now this certainly isn't the end of the world, but it can require a good amount of fixing in post and sometimes means I just recorded something that can't be used because the high end was just so ridiculously bright and sibilant. The cost is also maybe a bit high like the S-Mic 2, but still within the reach of the average person. Finally, like the Lewitt 440, this is also only a cardioid polar pattern, which can feel a little restrictive and be a bit frustrating, but there is also the AKG 414, which offers more polar patterns, but has a really big jump in price coming in at just over $1,000. Finally, to cap this off, I had just a couple specialty mics I wanted to show. These aren't really worth covering in any kind of gory details. These are more fun toys and extras than anything, but I figured it's worth showing. First up, I've got a harmonica microphone here. This is just kind of a fun thing for some crappy lo-fi type recordings and just kind of a character mic more than anything. I've also got a microphone here my grandpa and I built out of an old phone handset. This was like a 30 second job and just put in a quarter inch cable here. So this is a really easy project. You can probably find these in like an antique shop or thrift store or even, you know, in the garbage. You can find a handset. You can just reverse the wiring, put in uh, input of some kind and away you go. Next up here I've got this crappy tape recorder microphone. Uh, this came with this which my wife got me for Christmas and uh, just kind of a fun shitty sounding condenser question mark. I think it's some kind of omnidirectional lav mic thing inside of there maybe. I have no idea but a fun little toy. And finally of course this I have this cassette recorder which I can just record with the big mic hole here for amazing high fidelity monophonic audio so again just kind of a fun thing to play with overall the only real purpose these things serve is being character devices or microphones that provide something i just can't get elsewhere these are a fun way to get some extra versions of a sound or maybe try something from a new perspective kind of like a contact microphone and have something more off the wall to play around with in the daw I wouldn't really worry about getting any of this kind of stuff other than if you have some cash lying around and want to noodle around with something a little bit different. That's not to say that these things are useless, but honestly they really sit there collecting dust more often than not as I typically need a pretty specific reason to pull them out and I don't want to invest the entire recording session into one of these other than if it's just something I'm kind of doing for fun. because. I can add processing and stuff later, but if I commit to something with a really lo-fi crappy quality like I might get from one of these things, then I am stuck with that. So yeah, other than that, when it comes to recording here in my studio room, I honestly use the same microphones as I do out in the field, and that is because I try to be very selective with the equipment I use, and again, make sure it functions just as well in here as it does out there. I might use my Lewitt Match pair for recording a guitar, or some Foley sounds, or a piano or something. If I need a tight, focused version, I'll break out the S-Mic 2 here, and that's again because I try to make sure that whatever I have is very functional 
and practically contributes to my setup and my needs. When it comes to buying microphones, I think similar to something like plugins especially, it's really easy to fall into this trap of buying a bunch of things you just don't need. And it's easy to fall into like the marketing hype circle and whatnot. But I would really rather make sure I'm spending my money on things that are practical, flexible, and contribute to my setup and are really good at a lot of different things rather than having to spend all my money on a hundred different microphones that are all really good at one specific thing. So yeah, that's really it for my field recording setup anymore. I like to keep it nice and light and straightforward and just make sure I'm actually getting work done rather than obsessing over gear I might need or whatever. I think, again, the most powerful toolkit in any sound designer's arsenal is your noodle because if you're willing to put in the time to learn your gear inside and out and practice your techniques and practice your processing and learn and try and get things done, that's going to be a lot more valuable than worrying too much about what piece of gear and shiny object syndrome you think you need to do better. So all that is to say, I guess, don't feel discouraged, especially if you're just getting started in all this and you think you need this huge budget and all this cool stuff because you really don't. I don't think that there is anything that separates someone who is a sound designer from someone who is just getting started. I think it's just a matter of working to get there. And trust me, if I can do this stuff, so can you. So I think that wraps everything up for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. I hope you liked it. And as always, I hope this inspires you to get out there and make something awesome. Be sure to like and subscribe, and I will see you guys again soon.